Work matters. And most of us uh, spend more time at work than at any other place except our home. And we spend more time with our work colleagues than we do with our closest friends, in fact, and even our family. And just that revelation, you spend more time with your work colleagues than your closest friend, wow. What does that mean in relation to how I use my, my time and outwork my life at work? Um, so is work just a necessary evil until Jesus comes and takes us to heaven? Is it kind of like, oh, do I have to? Do we work so we can live, or is work actually a vital part of what it means to live life in this world to the fullest? Can we leverage and make the most of our work and all the interactions that we have at work so we can experience God's joy and purpose? Now, in this series that I'm kicking off, we're going to be looking at what it means to be followers of Jesus in our workplaces and how we can experience and expect to see the kingdom of God breaking out in and through us, through our work and all the relationships that we have in that environment. So to start off with, we need to actually look at what did Jesus say about work because he says some things. So let's start with Jesus and we can't go wrong there, can we? So Jesus firstly dignified work by the power of his own example. He was a contented carpenter in Nazareth for at least 15 years. Wow! His public ministry, preaching, teaching, discipling, healing people, commenced when he was around 30 years of age. And it lasted less than four years, and it ended on a cross. And the cross is the whole focus of Jesus' life and, and ministry, really. Um, half the Gospels, half the Gospels, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, maybe even more than half, centers around the final week of his life. In fact, one of the Gospels, it's more like the final day of, of his life. So all of God's purposes, Old Testament, New Testament, came to this ultimate climax, that God visiting the planet would die on a cross to deal with the central issue that separated us from God, our sins, our mistakes, and they needed to be removed and only Jesus Christ himself, God's son, could do it. And, and yet, he only spent three and a half years revealing to us what God the Father was like and then dying on a cross for our sins. He spent most of his life working as a carpenter. And we forget that. Um, there's no record of him doing any direct ministry during this time un uh, until he gets baptised in water. He just faithfully attends his local synagogue, local church like this, in Nazareth and he lives a good life and he lives a godly life in his community as he worked his trade in carpentry. Uh, in Luke 2 verses 51 to 52 it says this, then Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Now this is when he was 12. Now you know the story, he kind of mucked up a little bit. Yeah, Jesus the son of God gave his mother a little bit of trouble. He didn't sin, but he kind of was a bit testy with her and with Joseph because he hung around the temple in Jerusalem and he's listening to the teachers and, and so the, the caravan going back to Nazareth thought, well, Jesus is with us, the little boy. And he wasn't. They had to race back and she tells him off and he kind of tells her off back. It's interesting little dialogue. What 12-year-olds get up to? All parents, get ready for this if you've got primary school age kids. Eh? Um, but then it says this. He came back and he was obedient to them. He was good. He was a good kid, a wonderful teenager, and a great young adult. He did a trade with his earthly dad, and he excelled in it. He was known as the carpenter of Nazareth. And then his, his earthly dad passes away. There's no mention of him. And when he starts his ministry, 
um, in, in Mark 16, or look at that verse 52, it says, and he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So therefore, he had a good reputation in Nazareth. In other words, he was a good carpenter. He made good tables, good chairs. He excelled. And uh, otherwise, it may have said he was not very good at his profession. But he grew in wisdom and stature, both with God and man. Then when he started his ministry, the people of Nazareth were shocked. And this is what they said in Mark 6. Isn't this the carpenter? Hey, isn't this Mary's son? Like... What's going on? Now he's healing the sick and he's preaching and teaching and sharing. Um, and God the Father, when he gets baptized in water, this is the most beautiful uh, episode. When Jesus gets baptized in water by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, and it says that it's, it seemed like the Holy Spirit came on him. People could see, or John could see, like it was a, uh, like a dove coming upon him. God of peace and to anoint him, and, and the Father in heaven, it's like he pulls back the curtain of heaven and sticks his head out, smiling, because I don't know how you view God, you might view God the Father as being angry, but I don't know, I view him as a happy, loving, joyful Father, and he kind of appears out of heaven, he goes, wow, that's my boy, I love him, he's a good kid, I've watched him, because they had Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally together, but now the Son had left. And no longer a spirit being, now fully a human being. And God couldn't contain himself. And he says, he is a good kid. I love him so. I am so pleased with him. In other words, he's saying, he's been good in the home. He's been good in his community. He's been a hard worker as a carpenter. He's excelled, he's grown, he's matured. And, and, and I love him and, and I commend him now as he's about to commence the purpose of why he came to die on a cross, to share, to reveal what I'm like, God the Father, and to die on a cross to reconcile lost people to, to me. So God the Father can't contain himself on this. And yet, as we know, he was, up to this point in time, a son, a brother, a carpenter, a synagogue member, a person involved in his local community. Jesus, by the power of his own example, folks, validates your job and your career. Whatever it is, whatever you're doing, he validates it. It is part and parcel of God's creational order for all people. God's purpose regarding work was established before humanity fell into sin. Some people think, oh, work, it's part of the, the cursed earth, you know, kind of, I've got to work hard and toil. It's all because Adam and Eve sinned. No! He established work in the beginning. In Genesis 2, it says this in verse 15. The Lord God took the man, after he made him, and put him in the garden to what? Be a slacker. Just rest on a hammock. Or pray that God would make a woman for him so she could do all the work. Which in some societies today, sadly, that is the truth. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. So Jesus expects all people, he expects all of us here to busy ourselves with good work. The work that he has planned for us in this world that we live in. So Jesus dignified work by the power of his own example. Secondly, he also validated, I love this point, all types of careers, all types of careers by his embraceive ministry. He interacted with so many different people who were involved in, in various kinds of professions and occupations. And uh, from tax collectors to religious rulers. And I mentioned tax collectors and religious rulers because they weren't the popular boys. In fact, to be a tax collector, it was better that you be a prostitute than be a tax collector in the Jewish mind. They were hated. They were despised. They were the lowest of the low. How could you be a tax collector? In other words, you've got to be working for the Roman colonizers who are hated 
by the Jews. Secondly, to get the most money out of... So the Romans would say, OK, Phil, you're a tax collector. So, uh, so the taxes are, let's say you earn 100 bucks. Uh, what's our government? About 30% goes to tax? 25, 30? Let's say 50%. The Romans say 50% comes to Rome. Oh, that's a bit unfair. Let's say, let's say the Romans were better than our government, 20%. 20% goes to Rome, okay? But they wanted that 20%. Man, every 100 bucks you earn, 20 bucks goes to Rome or else. Not just a tax man bringing you up. <clears throat> they didn't muck around. But to get the money, they would say to the tax collectors, how you do it's your business. Wink, wink. So they would then go, you know what? You owe 40 bucks for every, every $100 you earn, you pay 40 bucks. 20 your pocket, 20 you give to Rome. Rome didn't care. In fact, Rome didn't care if you said 50 bucks and you kept 30 in Rome at 20, as long as you obeyed the law. So they were swindlers. They were swindlers. They were bad, bad dudes. Nobody liked them. Nobody hung around them. And if you did, there was something wrong with you. Like you kept them at a distance. Well, is that what Jesus did? Have a look at this verse. Romans 9.11. Sorry, Matthew 9.11. When the Pharisees saw this, this is the religious leaders, okay? The rulers. Now, we'll come to them in a few moments because they weren't a pretty group either. Why does your teacher, they asked his disciples, eat with tax collectors and sinners? Like, wow, the most disrespected type of work in Judea. How could he hang around these schemers? Well, he did. And religious rulers, let's not forget them. These people despised Jesus. The Sanhedrin were kind of like a political religious state within the Roman Empire. They had their state structures, the colonizing power. They had their procurators, Pontius Pilate. They had King Herod, who was an Edomite, to kind of subdue them. And, and they also had their religious rulers, and they all kind of worked in tandem. It was an unholy trinity, Rome, Herod, and the Sanhedrin, to try and keep these rebellious Jewish people in place. It was a unique form of governance, different to every other province of, of Rome. And so they were despised as well. They weren't like, but there were some who were believers. Some of the Sanhedrin actually believed in Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And, and it says this about Nicodemus. Now there was a man, John 3, 1-2, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night because he was scared. Kind of, he was scared and didn't want to be publicly associated, didn't want to be seen publicly associating with Jesus. And, um, and so uh, they ultimately prevailed the Sanhedrin and they had Jesus arrested uh, on blasphemy and sedition charges and uh, worked through the court system, different trials he went through with them, also with uh, uh, King Herod and also with, with uh, the Roman procurator. And interestingly though, interestingly, Jesus didn't say to the tax collectors, and he didn't say to the religious rulers, boys, if you want to be my followers, change your jobs. Okay? His message was, you follow me and your heart's going to be changed. Your life is going to be changed and you're going to be the best tax collector possible. You ain't going to steal and swindle and cheat and my light's going to shine through you. Nicodemus, when you're born from above, you're, you're going to be a witness of what God really wants to do, not just to change the outward life but to change the inner life. A man must be born again. You can't just be come into the, the kingdom of God by position or status or any other way. Uh, you've got to be spiritually born again. So he's saying, guys, you don't change your jobs. He validated all types of careers by his embrace of ministry. We can be fully devoted followers of Jesus and still pursue a successful career for his glory. And I say a successful career, we should aim to be successful. We should aim to do our very best. I mean, what's the alternative? Second best? Third best? Let's just bum around and, and just get our weekly paycheck and steal from the boss and, and kind of go late and leave early and be a slacker? 
There's no alternative, particularly as a Christian. We do our very best. We turn up early. We leave later. We do extra work. We, in fact, want to, to use that time to achieve and succeed. Why? For our own vanity? No. To ensure that when people look at us and they identify that we're Christians, they don't go, oh, yeah, Christ doesn't make a difference in their life. But they should say, hey, he makes such a difference to you. Most of us are called to serve Jesus through God-honouring careers and at the same time to outwork his purposes and to extend his influence by our involvement in the church's various ministries. And we did a series on this a few months ago and I mentioned to you that this church would fall over if it wasn't for all the people who are serving so we have certain paid staff. There are certain roles that we say, oh, look, we need somebody to come in nine to one or you know, nine to five, one day a week. Two. There's certain things that have to be done in our system and our... Uh, uh, but look, if, if we could avoid that and have it all done by the body, in fact, that would be fantastic. Um, but I know this place here, you work out how many of us here on a Sunday, I think we did the figures, who are actually paid. I think there might be... So four or five of us, but the rest of the roles are all done by people who come in on a Tuesday night, who work, um, come in on a Thursday night, who, who volunteer, their, I hate even using the term volunteer, who actually serve according to how they're wired and how they're shaped to serve Jesus' purposes through his church. Um, I was in a church in Athens. The pastor is Pastor George Patsouris, and just two weeks, three weeks ago, and uh, he is a famous lawyer. So in the 1970s, early 80s, he, he worked through a, a whole pile of cases to allow religious freedom in, in, in Greece. He were all the way up to their highest court, working against the ecclesiastical authorities, the Sanhedrin of, of Greece, who were trying to stop people from actually presenting the gospel because, you know, everyone's saved. I mean, if you're brought up Greek, you know, like, of course you're a Christian. You got sprinkled as a baby, you got done, so you're a Christian. And, um, and I'm thankful that my parents did that to me as a little kid. They, 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 they said, hey, we, we, we want, you to, to, want our children to grow up with a Christian framework. But that didn't actually make me a born-again Christian until I was 17 and I received Christ. And then I got baptised in water by immersion, like Jesus was done as a baby too. He was dedicated. And, and then at 30 years of age, he was baptised in water. So I'm not against tradition as such if people believe that okay but the reality is the life of God has to be internal and and so this guy Pastor George he's fighting as a lawyer and he actually pioneered a church in 19, 1965 so when he found out I was I'm leading a church for 39 years he goes that's fine I'm 52 beat that so he put me in my place 52 years in one church and uh, so he, he then went full-time in 2004. It's the largest Pentecostal church in Greece, 750 people as such. And so I said, oh, George, you know, then, then you, you got on salary? He goes, no. And how do you live? Because I'm my super. Because I was a successful lawyer. I've got a decent super scheme and I live on that. Well, how many staff do you have? Oh, hundreds. And I said, well, how many paid staff? He goes, none. And then none? Not one person receives a salary. All their income goes to, to cover the ministries, 30 ministries they have, and their fabulous facilities. I mean, they are fabulous facilities that they have. And so I say, well, who does your letters? Like, I've written letters to you, and you get back to me within a few hours. He goes, well, I've got three of them. They come in at, at, at 4 o'clock when they finish work, 4 o'clock, and they work through to 8 o'clock and do all my letters every day. I'm like, wow. Now, so who runs the kids... It's every ministry is run by people volunteering their time and serving according to how they're wired. And I thought, wow, that is something. So that fired me up to come back here and just talk about it on a Sunday morning. <laughs> but you know, the principle, you get what I'm saying. He's not saying it shouldn't be. For him it works and for their system it works. But the point is that we're all shaped for ministry. And, and Jesus wants us to be fruitful and to be, in, and for that ministry to be fulfilling. But uh, so, so we are to, to be missionaries 
in our workplace. We are to succeed where God has placed us in the workplace and we are to serve Jesus through his church as well in the various ministries. It's not an either or. And uh, so Jesus dignified work by the power of his own example and he validated all types of, of careers by his embraceive ministry. Thirdly, I love this too, his heart, Jesus' heart is for all workers, every one of you here, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly through your careers, as the prophet Micah would say in Micah 6, 8. And there are so many parables and so many stories by Jesus, and probably the most famous parable, or one of the most famous, is, would be the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know the story. Guy's heading to Jericho and he gets beaten up, gets robbed. They nearly killed him, steal from him. He's lying half dead, beaten, and the religious people go past. The good people who were religious, good outwardly and good religiously, and they see him, and what do they do? They cross the other side. They let him go. Not, Jesus is not very impressed with that. But then it says a Samaritan came. So two people passed him by, a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews. Jews and Samaritans never talked to each other. In fact, the Jews regarded Samaritans as dogs. They were half-breeds because they were kind of a bit Jewish and a bit mixed and they were just up north in the Galilee, sort of on, on the left of Galilee. And, um, and so Jews would actually walk around to go up to Galilee rather than go through Samaria. And so there was terrible racism and animosity and hatred between these two groups. Never talked to each other. And so Jesus says it was a Samaritan that came. <gasps> Straight away, people go, shock horrors, you know, tss, you know, a Samaritan doing good. And the guy does good. And have a look at the story. It's beautiful. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Mercy. Compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds. So he actually took time to personally help him, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. So he, he walks and puts the man on and brings him to an inn to take and took care of him. So he takes him there, doesn't dump him. He takes care of him. He spends the night there. And, uh, and the next day, he takes out some money, two denarii, which was no small amount, gives him to the innkeeper, and he says, look after him. Now, how do you know the innkeeper's going to look after him? You don't know. The innkeeper, he says, I'm going to come back. There's going to be an accounting. <laughs> I'm a businessman. He's, he's sharp, this guy. He says, I've got to go. I've got a program. He's a worker. He's, he's, he's a boss. He's, he's a businessman. He, he's got to go and outwork his program. So you see ministry, and yet he still has to. But then what does he do? He shows concern and says, could you now look after him? When I come back, I'll fix you up for anything extra. So he says, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. What is it that Jesus is saying to us through this amazing parable? You know what he's saying? This afternoon when you go to your secular work, or tonight, or tomorrow, always be available, always be available to show mercy during your working week. This is not just the domain of your church ministry. I'll be merciful on a Sunday. I'll be merciful and uh, show kindness to one of the ministry groups of the church that I serve in, but, but at work, who cares? It's just, just a, you know, boss and workers and, and, you know, no real relationship with them. No, no, he's saying, hey, during your working week, Jesus wants us to act just like him wherever we are and whenever the opportunity arises. Just like this Samaritan who was an incredibly busy, busy man. This week, in your great busyness, and some of you are really busy, but if you think you're really busy, come and talk to me and I'll tell you what busyness really looks like. And uh, sometimes I wake up and I think, what day is it? Where am I? Oh, I'm in Bucharest, not Athens. Oh, okay, yeah, yes, right. Or maybe it's kind of one of those senior moments too, but... but uh, <laughs> But this week in your great business, there will be someone out there. You can't tell me this week, seven days, between now and next Sunday morning, there isn't somebody 
that you can be loving towards and somebody that you can show mercy to and to help them, to enable them. Joseph of Arimathea, what a wonderful human being he was. He was like Nicodemus, part of the ruling Sanhedrin, but he was a good man. And so God has his people, even in corrupt areas. How's that? There might be institutions that are corrupt. There might be jobs that you think, man, you don't want to go in there, but God's got his people. He's got his people who are a witness. And Joseph was a wealthy man. He was rich. And uh, he got converted. And uh, we love his heart towards Jesus. Have a look at what he does in Matthew 27. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate... He asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Wow. Now, a great personal risk to himself, because there was a murderous atmosphere there. It was mob mentality. I mean, the mob that welcomed Jesus, also another mob was saying crucify him, and let out Barabbas, who was a really bad man, a murdering scoundrel, let him out instead of Jesus. I mean, like mob mentality, mob rule. And uh, the atmosphere was poisonous. And so for you to go to Pilate, I mean, he's, he's in a hanging mood. But his, his wife says to him, don't do it. I've had a bad, uh, leave me alone, woman. I'm the Roman procurator, uh, you know. So he's in a hanging mood. You come to him and say, I'd like Jesus' body. And you're one of his, are you? Are you one of his followers? you also a seditious person? You want to become, you think there's going to be another king rather than Caesar? Get him. Put him in there. Flog him. I mean, it could have happened to Joseph with bravery, courage. He goes to him and he gives him his own tomb and he pays for the funeral expenses and they were expensive spices and ointments. Like now, funerals are expensive. They were expensive back then. I've been to Joseph Arimathea's tomb. I was there last year in the garden tomb. And uh, I don't accept that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the place. I just, uh, even though they kicked me out because I was wearing shorts, that's not the reason. <laughs> 62 years, haven't been to Israel, and I go to a jolly church. First time ever in my life I get kicked out of church. Can you believe it? <laughs> and it was a fellow Greek that did it to me. Anyway, because I was wearing shorts and he didn't like the look of my legs anyway. <laughs> So I go to the garden too, man, that was something. And they reckon that's the authentic place because the more they've done archaeological sites is they found a wine press there and they realised there was an irrigation system wine press and it was, it was obviously owned by somebody with some means. And then the tomb is actually cut into a cave and it just had all the marks of authenticity for me anyway. So I had a wonderful time of prayer and worship there just, just uh, honouring Jesus. But um, So this guy... Um, at great cost to himself. He steps out. He's a wealthy man. He could have been arrested. He could have been beaten. You don't know what could have happened. He could have been scourged. So what, what am I saying here? Is be courageous by standing up for justice in your work environment. Some work environments are terrible when it comes to injustice, when it comes to bullying, when it comes to uh, sexual harassment, you know, the subtlety of that is, is like sort of an unsafe place for women to work. And uh, as a father of three daughters, I mean, it used to drive me crazy, you know, and uh, to think that my kids could be picked upon because of their women, for a start, and, uh, and harassed and, and bullying because somebody doesn't dress the part or doesn't look like they're, you know, they're, they're not so cool. And it's so easy, a sinful nature, to pick on the person who's not so cool or who's the underdog. And there's something perverse in our humanity, the sinful nature, where we don't support the underdog and we, and we show disrespect and lack of kindness. And, you know, governments try and legislate and try and change the human heart and, and it doesn't quite work. Uh, I remember Nikki, my beautiful daughter, when she was about 12 in God's Mob, and there, were, there was a boy that was being picked on. And bullied, basically, by another couple of kids. And just because he was not the cool kid. And I found out later that she tore strips off the other two. I said, you did? What'd you do? What'd you say? She did everything but swear at them. <laughs> and 
And those kids never bullied that, that kid again. But I was really proud of her, you know, like, because she, she, she went for the uncool kid and somebody that was, even in the church environment, you can have a child that bullies another child. In, in our Christian schools, it can happen. And it's important to stand up and to, to speak up and to be courageous and to be generous like Joseph and Nicodemus. Giving is a gateway to express Jesus' love to people. I tell you, if you're just generous with your time and your friendship and your interest in people, and uh, last night when they did a speech regarding Nathan and uh, David Bland did the speech, and one of the comments that came through, that is so true, is that when Nathan asks you, how are you doing, it's not just, oh, how are you doing? How are you? He'll look in the eye and say, how are you doing? And he expects a response. And then if you're not doing too well, he will talk to you. That's impressive. That's true. So just even how are you really doing? And look into a person's eyes and look into their soul and, and pick up the, the body language and the vibe and the, the, the awareness. Is, is everything okay? Does that person just need a bit of TLC at work? I mean, the world's pretty brutal. I mean, the world's pretty brutal. There's a lot. I mean, you think of your own life. I think of my own life. I think, man, the issues I face and the stresses and the pains and the burdens and difficulties. And, and I think, man, I so need Jesus every day. Rarely 30 minutes passes where I'm not shooting a prayer up to the Lord. And I'm a pretty strong guy. What about out there when they don't have Jesus? What kind of attacks the enemy brings upon people, what kind of difficulties they face. So at your workplace, don't judge them by what they look like. May God open your eyes and unblock your ears and sensitise your heart to actually pick up because there are people in need. And, uh, and be loving towards them, be giving towards them, be generous towards them, just your time, your effort. I'm not talking about just giving money. Finally, what does Jesus expect of all employees and employers? <laughs> now, um, this is a really... I, I want to actually open this up a little bit more next week. Get, get, get really practical. And I'll give you some stories of, of some work situations I've been in that haven't been pleasant. And Pastor Phil told me one job that he had. I said, oh, thank God I never had that job. I might get you to share it next week, Phil, because that was... Oh, you're overseas. Next week. Oh, can you change that to... to share? <laughs> Let Janet kind of run. You come in and share. It'll be fine. Okay. Where are you, Janet? And, um, but what does Jesus expect of all employees and employers? This is a, a, a fabulous passage. And uh, he says this to... He says, okay, slaves. Now, you remember the Roman Empire had, I don't know how many million slaves. It's a terrible society. It wasn't slavery as we know it, where it was race-based. It was conquered-based. If you got conquered, <laughs> you were sold, and you had to work for other people. So, so some of the slaves were, you couldn't tell they were slaves. They looked like Romans. But they, and they could actually buy their freedom um, and become citizens as well. It was a terrible institution. Lots of any kind of slavery is a shocker. Um, but it was the reality in the Roman Empire until Jesus overturned it through the power of the gospel uh, as the gospel took root in that empire. But Paul says this, hey, slaves, and let's say employees here, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Really interesting, the Greek words that he uses here. Because obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, when the boss is watching you, but as slaves of Christ, transforms it, work. Saying, hey, who's your real boss? Doing the will of God from your heart. So he's actually saying, work is part of the will of God. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving Jesus. He goes, forget it's the boss. You're serving Jesus. That transforms the whole nature of work. Because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. Then he goes, now bosses, masters, and I love this one. He says, treat your slaves in the same way. In other words, treat others as you want to be treated, the golden rule. And the golden rule transformed the institution of slavery. It, it couldn't last. If people became believers in Christ, 
and they were changed on the inside. Gradually, over time, they actually th busted the institution and got rid of it because it was incompatible with mercy and grace and forgiveness and, and Jesus. Jesus hates slavery, and this is how he, he, he destroyed it. There's masters, employers. Treat your slaves in the same way, your employees in the same way. Do not threaten them. So do you know that he is both their master and yours in heaven? Okay, you've got the same boss. And there's no favoritism with him. There's a basic equality and dignity of all people. He writes a letter to a slave owner named, named Philemon. One letter, just one chapter. Because Philemon's slave, Onesimus, ran away, didn't earn his freedom, so it's illegal, it's a capital offence, like he can be killed. Because he runs away and then Onesimus gets saved. So Paul finds out he gets saved and he goes, okay, you're a runaway slave and your, your boss is Philemon and he writes a letter to Philemon and it's a fantastic letter. You've got to read it. And he actually he says to the Philemon, you and Onesimus are now brothers because Philemon got saved too. You are brothers. Ah, you're brothers in Christ. You've got the same God. You're all going to be judged by him. And, and you can see what Paul is saying that if this takes root, it will destroy the very basis of, of the institution of slavery, which, which it did. And so his, this passage is, is fabulous. And though the letter is written in the context of a slave society, the principles of this section apply to all of us, whether you're a boss or whether you are a worker, employee or employer. And um, the gospel ushers in a new reality that all people, all people, all of us here can receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, irrespective of our social status, irrespective of our personal behaviour, and this gospel of Jesus Christ transforms people and it transforms our workplaces. I've been in some workplaces that are horrible and one Christian, two Christians, who really live the life can actually transform that environment and make a, a massive impact. He has a lot to say to us about working. And next week and the following weeks, we're going to open this area up. So it's working out there. He dignifies it, as, as I've mentioned, the things that, that uh, um, we've shared already today. Next week, we're going to open it up even more. Jesus dignifies work, folks by the power of his own example. He validates all types of careers by his embrace of ministry. And his heart for all workers is to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly through our careers. And he has such high expectations on us because now he's living in us and we've got to make a difference to our world to be an effective witness of his, of his life and grace and mercy. Can we stand together as I lead you in prayer?